A very good evening aspirants. Welcome to Daily Newspaper Analysis of Shankar IAS Academy. Today's date is 21st of May 2024. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I have an important announcement for you. The most awaited All India mock test for UPSC prelims 2024 has been revived. The registration link is open to apply. You can write the test on both online and offline modes. The test will be conducted on 26th May 2024, 2nd June and 9th June 2024. So what are you waiting for? Just register in the link given below and attend the test to check your preparedness for UPSC prelims 2024. So with this note, let us look into the list of articles for the day. This play here are the list of articles that we are going to discuss today. So without much delay, let us get into the previous question discussion. Look at this first question. With reference to the Constitution of India, the DPSP constitute limitations upon firstly legislative functions, secondly executive functions. So you have to find which of the above statement is or are correct. See, to answer this particular question, you should know about DPSP. Article 36 to 51 under Part 4 of Indian Constitution deals with Directive Principles of State Policy DPSP. See, they were borrowed from the Constitution of Ireland and they are ideals which are meant to be kept in mind by the state when it formulates policies and enact law. So, what are the features of DPSP? Firstly, they are similar to Instrument of Instruction which are enumerated in the Government of India Act. 1935. Secondly, DPSP seeks to establish economic and social democracy in the country. Thirdly, DPSP are ideals which are not legally enforceable by the courts for their violation. So, with this basics, let us try to answer this particular question. Here, the first statement says DPSP constitute limitations upon legislative functions. See, even though DPSP poses a moral obligation on the state, they do not pose legal obligation on the enactment of the law. So, this statement is incorrect. The second statement says it constitute limitation upon executive functions. Remember, DPSC also won't pose any legal obligation on the executive function of the state. Anyway, they are not justiciable in nature. So, it means you cannot go to the court asking for its enforcement. So, the second statement is also incorrect. So, the correct answer for this particular question is option D. Moving on, look at this question about Prohibition of Binami Property Transaction Act 1988. See here, three statements are given and you have to find which of the statements given here is or are correct. Now, before answering this particular question, what is Binami property? See, any property which is the subject matter of a Binami transaction and also include the proceeds from such property is known as Binami property. The Prohibition of Binami Property Transaction Act 1988 aims to prohibit this Binami transaction and confiscate Binami properties. A Binami transaction is a transaction where a property is transferred to one person for a consideration paid or provided by another person and the property is held for the immediate or future benefit, direct or indirect of the person who has provided the consideration. Okay? So, let us analyze this particular question and try to answer it. The first statement says, a property transaction is not treated as a Binami transaction if the owner of the property is not aware of the transaction. See, this statement is actually incorrect. According to PBPT Act, a property transaction will be considered as Binami even if the owner of the property is not aware of the transaction. In fact, one of the main objective of the act is to tackle the problem of Binami transaction where the real owner of the property is not disclosed. Now, the second statement says properties held binami or liable for confiscation by the government. See, this statement is correct under the act properties held binami or liable for confiscation by the government. The act provides for the confiscation of binami property which means the government can take over the property without paying any compensation to the binamider. Binamider is the person whose name the property is held. The confiscated property is then vested in the central government free from all encumbrance. Now look at this third statement. This statement says the act provides for three authorities for investigation but does not provide for any appellate mechanism. So this statement is partially correct. The act provides for three authority for investigation namely the initiating officer, the approving authority and the adjudicating authority. However, the act also provides for an appellate mechanism. Any person aggrieved by an order of the adjudicating authority can file an appeal to the appellate tribunal within 45 days of the date of the order. Further, any person aggrieved by an order of the appellate tribunal can file an appeal to the high court within 60 days of the date of the order. So, so, the correct answer for this particular question is option B2 only because the first and third statement are incorrect. So, with this, let us move on to the news article discussion. 
we have a ethics question for today's discussion let me read out the question for you is conscience a more reliable guide when compared to laws rules and regulations in the context of ethical decision making discuss see this kind of a question needs conceptual clarity in ethics syllabus and we should also need to apply it with other parts of the syllabus to write a holistic answer note that each of your argument should have an example to substantiate your argument now let us see the skeleton of the answer see in the introduction part you can define about conscience its importance in decision making then you can also differentiate it with laws regulations which influences decisions then in the main body you should write a written discussion on the advantages of using conscience as a reliable guide to take decision and we can talk about the limitations of conscience so this is how we are going to approach this particular question moving on to the introduction part here you can write that conscience is a capacity intuition or in a sense that help to distinguish right from wrong it is one of the important sources of decision making in our everyday life on the other hand laws rules and regulations are established standards of society that dictate to individuals what is acceptable and what is not though both look different often they are complementary to each other moreover comparing and contrasting them for ethical decision making is a complex task as both have their strengths and limitation so you can write these points in the introduction part and you can move on to the main body of the answer here you have to first write about the advantages of using it conscience as a guide See, firstly, it promotes moral autonomy. Actually, conscience enables one to perform morally courageous action. This is because it enables the individual to exercise free will in moral judgments based on the inherent goodness rather than the external forces like law, act, and etc. For example, Oscar Schindler saved over a thousand Jewish refugees during World War II by empowering them. in his factories this decision has been driven by his conscience secondly laws are prone to the biasness of the regions and cultures there is conscience relies on universal ethics also note that conscience itself can be shaped by social conditioning thirdly ethics can be used for analyzing and navigating complex situations see there can be situations where we find ourselves in a moral dilemma whether to follow morals or ethics in these situations conscience guides our actions by saying that even violating law for a greater good is correct this can be understood by a saying of martin luther king junior who said that one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws fourthly conscience creates self accountability to steer inner moral standards as franklin said the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing moreover it will help us to take empathetic decision making so you can write these points in the first part of the body now in the second part of the body you can write about the limitations of conscience and why law and regulations should be there to balance it firstly conscience is a highly subjective phenomena so it may lead to ambiguities and that is why it should be balanced by legal frameworks see laws regulations provide a consistent set of rules that applies to everyone within a given jurisdiction so it may give minimum uniformity which is necessary for the harmony of the society secondly vulnerabilities to manipulation see conscience can be manipulated or misguided particularly when individuals are under external pressure or influenced by group dynamics for example it is in the collective conscience of the german people during nazi era where individuals suppressed their personal moral judgments in favor of conforming to a group's unethical actions thirdly an individual's conscience may not always consider the broader societal impact of their actions for example a business person's conscience may guide her to maximize profit even if it involves harm to the environment and exploitation of workers so law and regulations without conscience is like a human body without soul so you can write these points in the second part of your answer now coming to the conclusion here you can quote any sayings or quotes i am quoting mahatma gandhi as gandhi said there is higher courts than courts of justice and that is conscience but such conscience should be balanced by laws and regulations to impart justice 
objectivity in decision making and etc moreover the ideal approach should be balancing laws and conscience this can be done by exercising conscience within the spirit of just laws and evolving regulations based on the principle of fairness and equality so you can write these points and give a balanced answer so in this mains answer writing discussion we saw in detail about conscience and why it is a guide compared to laws rules and regulation and what are its limitation so with these learn to points now let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this image this image shows a boat that is navigating through kudur river at kotayam in kerala it says that the heavy rain has cleared a path through vada hyacinth and lifted water levels in the river so in this backdrop let us understand about invasive species and some of the initiatives that has been taken to prevent them so what are invasive species See these species or non-native species that significantly modifies or disrupt the ecosystem it colonizes. Invasive species enters into an existing ecosystem through natural migration or they may be introduced by the activities of other species. Some of the common characteristics of invasive species include firstly rapid reproduction, high dispersal ability, ability to survive in a wide range of environmental condition, then ability to adapt physiologically to new conditions. So these are all the major characteristics. Now the major issue with the species is that they can harm the environment, economy or human health. See whenever they colonize the ecosystem, it grows at a faster rate. and becomes difficult and expensive to control them they also transform the soil structure and micro environment to their advantage by producing allelo chemicals which cause the destruction of native species and local biodiversity this is the reason why they cause a major harm to environment economy or human health government of india maintains and updates its database of invasive species as per the information received from geological survey of india is that as i a total of 154 species of faunal communities including 56 species from terrestrial and freshwater ecosystem and 98 species of marine ecosystem are recorded from india as exotic or invasive species Now let us see the initiatives taken to manage these invasive alien species. So firstly, the establishment of National Biodiversity Authority under Biological Diversity Act 2002. See this particular body implements strategies for the prevention and management of invasive species including aquatic one. Then the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change has launched National Action Plan on Invasive Alien Species. This mission focuses on preventing new introductions early detection control and management of established invasive alien species then the national invasive species information center this center provides information and resource on invasive species in india and raises awareness about the issue it provides access to information on invasive species in order to improve the management and prevention of their spread and it supports researchers policy makers and general public by offering resources and data on invasive species finally under the department of agriculture and cooperation dac plant quarantine regulation of import into india order 2003 has been issued this order regulates the import of plant and plant materials to prevent the introduction of invasive species so these are all some of the india specific initiatives now let's see about the global level initiatives see the first one is convention on biological diversity see this cbd and its party including india recognize the urgent need to address the impacts of ias that is the invasive alien species article 8 h of the cbd states that each party should prevent the introduction control and eradicate alien species that threaten ecosystem habitat or species then the cbd sets global priorities guidelines then collect information and helps coordinate international action on invasive alien species finally the iucn invasive species specialist group this group manages the global invasive species database and the global register of introduced and invasive alien species this database provides information on invasive species across taxonomic groups to support management efforts so these are all certain important facts that you have to remember about invasive species and how it can be controlled or managed so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion 
Look at this text and context page article. It states that India's rising consumer spending and growing population make it an increasingly attractive market for foreign businesses, potentially rivaling China. While China has a larger economy, India's fastest growth in consumption and favorable demographics presents significant opportunity. So this is what the article is talking about. So let us try to break down the article and understand few facts from the article. Firstly, let us see the consumer spending and market potential of both both the countries see in 2023 india surpassed china as the world's most populous country reflecting significant demographic shifts china's birth rate and total fertility rate has declined leading to its first negative population growth in 60 decades and an increasing dependency ratio conversely india's population despite reaching replacement fertility level which is 2.1 children per woman is expected to grow until around 2060 these demographic changes have profound implications for domestic consumption in both countries. Now let us see about consumption pattern. See both India and China have large consumer bases defined as individuals spending over $12 a day. Here the private final consumption expenditure PFCE serves as a key measure of consumer spending. India's PFCE accounts for over 58% of its GDP significantly higher than China's 38% including government consumption. The figures are 68% for India and 53% for China indicating a larger government role in China's economy. While China's overall economy is approximately 5 times larger than India's, its PFCE is only about 3.5 times that of India's. This suggests that consumer spending is a more crucial driver for India's economy. Notably, India's consumption level are expected to match China's at a GDP of about $10 trillion compared to China's $17 trillion. So with this basic understanding, now let's look into the recent trend. See, China's PFCE saw a marked increase over the past few years despite stagnation in 2020 due to the pandemic. In contrast, India's PFCE rose from $1.64 trillion in 2018 to $2.10 trillion in 2022. While China's PFCE slightly declined in 2022, both in aggregate and per capita terms, India's figures grew. Although the spending gap between the two countries widened from $3.8 trillion in 2018 to over $4.5 trillion in 2022. Importantly, India's PFCE ratio to China's narrowed from approximately 3.3 to 3.1, indicating faster growth in India's consumer spending. So here you might have a doubt where India is spending. See, India is spending more on essentials like food, clothing and transportation, which is typical of developing countries. China, however, shows spending pattern of a more developed market with a declined percentages spending on food and, and increasing shares on housing, recreation, education and healthcare. In total, India spends about half of what China does on food, transport and clothing, but shows stronger real growth rates in these categories. Now, what are the implications for foreign businesses? See, India's rising consumer class and spending growth enhance its attractiveness to foreign businesses. The demographic trends along with the China plus one strategy position India as a potential preferred destination. However, it remains uncertain if India will fully eclipse China in appeal for foreign investors. The ongoing growth and consumption trends will play a crucial role in shaping this dynamics. So these are all very relevant facts that you have to remember about from this news article. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. According to the article, India's largest dairy corporation, Amul, has started selling fresh milk and other products in United States through a partnership with the Michigan Milk Producers Association, MMPA. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us revise about major revolutions in India, especially agriculture revolution in India, for our prelims examination. See, first, with respect to Green Revolution, Green Revolution in India is initiated in the 1960s. This revolution brought about a significant transformation in agriculture by introducing high yield variety seeds, chemical fertilizer, pesticides, improved irrigation and mechanization. It was supported by government policies and subsidies and it led to substantial increase in food grain production, particularly wheat and rice. This also made India self-sufficient in food grains and boosting the rural economy. However, the benefits were unevenly distributed with the states like Punjab, Haryana and Uttar Pradesh reaping most of the rewards 
thereby creating regional disparities. Additionally, the intensive use of chemical and water resources resulted in environmental issues like soil degradation, water pollution, and groundwater depletion. While the Green Revolution reduced hunger and enhanced food security, it also exacerbated social and economic inequalities, highlighting the need for sustainable agricultural practices and more inclusive policies to address these challenges. So this is about the Green Revolution. Now talking about the White Revolution, it is also known as Operation Flood. It was a significant initiative in India which aimed at transforming the dairy industry and making the country self-sufficient in milk production. It was launched in 1970 and was headed by Verghese Kurian, who is often referred as the father of White Revolution. This movement was instrumental in making India one of the largest producers of milk and dairy products in the world. Then thirdly, Gold Revolution. See, this revolution aimed at increasing the production and productivity of horticulture crops in India. The revolution focused on cultivation of fruits, vegetables, spices, flowers and other high value crops. Then the Grey Revolution. It is centered on fertilizers aimed at enhancing agricultural productivity in India by increasing the use and efficiency of chemical fertilizers. It is implemented throughout the Green Revolution and beyond and it focused on development and distribution of chemical fertilizers to farmers across the country. While it resulted in increased agricultural yields, there are growing concerns about soil health and environmental sustainability due to extensive reliance on chemical inputs. Finally, the Black Revolution it is centered on petroleum and hydrocarbons aimed to improve India's energy security by increasing petroleum production and striving for energy self-sufficiency. This ongoing initiative involves the exploration of oil and natural gas fields coupled with the adoption of improved extraction technologies. While it has led to enhanced energy security for the nation, the Black Revolution is not without challenges. Environmental concerns including pollution and habitat destruction accompany the extraction and utilization of fossil fuels. So these are all certain important revolutions that you have to remember for the upcoming prelims. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Look at this first question. Which of the following agricultural revolution in India is primarily associated with the significant growth and modernization of the poultry industry? See, the correct answer here is option A, silver revolution. The silver revolution in India is linked to the remarkable expansion and modernization of the poultry industry, resulting in substantial growth in eggs and poultry meat production. This revolution involved the introduction of advanced breeding techniques, improved management practices and the adoption of modern technologies in poultry farming. So the correct answer here is option A. Moving on, look at this question. Which of the following invasive aquatic plants pose a significant threat to water bodies in India by forming dense mats and causing ecological imbalance? See here the correct answer is option D. Water hyacinth. Water hyacinth is native to South America, particularly the Amazon basin. It is believed to have been introduced to India during the late 90s century for ornamental purposes and for its ability to purify water in aquatic gardens. However, due to its fast growth rate and lack of natural predators in Indian ecosystem, water hyacinth quickly spread and became invasive in many water bodies across the India. So the correct answer here is option D. Displayed here is the main practice question for you today. Just go through the question and try to answer it in the comment section. With this, we came to the end of the news article discussion. If you like the video, hit like, do comment and don't forget to subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel. Now, thank you so much for listening.